Right, first of all, um, nice straightforward one for you all. Did or didn't Rachel Blackmore ride a finish a circuit too early? This is a case that's been reopened by the Irish Horse Racing Reg Regulatory Board after the, the stewards found, the local stewards, found that whilst they may not have believed her testimony that the horse was a bit leery and she was just giving the horse a breather, um, that they had no evidence to, to suspend her, therefore therefore they didn't. But the case has been reopened. James, did she ride a finish a circuit too, too early? I don't think it's a matter of whether she write, whether she kicks on early. I think I think the problem is, as you can see on the screen here, is that she's she's looked to pull the horse up. Um, so it, it it doesn't look great. Um, so I think you'd have to say yes, but I'm I'm not the judge. Um, Dave, isn't this a case where no matter what the testimony the jockey gives the stewards, have just got to take a view and get on with it? Definitely. Um, I think that. As James points out, the, the, the difficulty, you know, when I think it's fair to say that she urges uh, Lady Rita to the front. It's not it's not particularly animated arm movement, but there is arm movement there. She doesn't raise her stick, but it's definitely the bit after the winning post, isn't it, whereby she reins the horse back in. Um, James Griffin said, uh, the co course commentator, I think she may have mistaken uh, the winning post. Her explanation was that she wanted to ensure a strong gallop and then that Lady Rita became Larry in front and so she reined back. I, I think the crucial bit of that video is just the the way that she does rein back. And I, I don't think it's an open and shut case, but I think that's quite persuasive. I, th I think that is persuasive. From a jockey's point of view then? I think you said earlier that um, they didn't have substantial evidence and um, it's it's a a, re a hard one to comment on, but um, she's never actually pushed the horse, like full out pushed the horse, and she's never picked her stick up either. And um, I can see everyone's arguments, but it's a it's a hard one to comment on. Balance of probability, though. D do you think she wrote to finish the circuit? Early? I know I shouldn't for laugh. Me, yeah, this, for is me. A this is a serious point. <laughs> but it, it As you said, for me, it's, it's the part after the line um, where if. She's obviously gone to make that manoeuvre and, yeah, that is the part off the line that I think makes makes it difficult. Um, there is a bit of a... Uh, the, the one similar incident I can, I can remember where a jockey has tried to absolve themselves after a similar error was Sam Whaley Cohen at Fakenham. Do you remember this? Yeah. yeah. Back in 2011, and he had a long run to ride in the King George and he went to miss the, the fence that you're supposed to jump, which you don't jump on the last circuit... And then quick thinking, he, he jumped off the horse and said he felt the horse go slightly wrong. The steward didn't believe him, gave him 11 days anyway. So I, I think sometimes you know, everyone's going to chance their arm in a regulatory situation, aren't they? Or some people yeah. are, um, if they think they can. And it's then up to the, to the stewards to say, but sorry, as long as it's don't believe you. As long as it's fair for everyone. And if it was a £7 claim, they would receive the same ban for the same thing. And, this is, and I think this is a point that's been raised by a few people. Is she getting special treatment? Yeah, every, everyone must be equal before the law, wasn't they? Yep. That's one of the principles of uh, any legal system. <coughs> exactly. Uh, now, this next case could, could get quite complex. This is Sylvester de Souza, multiple champion jockey in the UK, has gone to ride in Hong Kong, and he's received a 10-month suspension for, in the words of the Hong Kong Jockey Club, facilitating the placing of a bet. He didn't ride the horse in question. He didn't either back or lay the horse in question. And there's no suggestion that he in said race didn't ride on his merits, nor is there a suggestion that the jockey aboard the horse who was backed, uh, Wagner Borges, fellow Brazilian rider, um, didn't ride in any other way according to the rules. But uh, both have pleaded guilty, Borges, to placing a bet and D'Souza for facilitating the placing of a bet, whatever that means, I'm not quite sure. But right. Borges got 12 months, D'Souza's got 10 months, which at the moment will be reciprocated worldwide. He has indicated that he will appeal. Yeah. You said it's about to get complex. Well, the press release from the Hong Kong Jockey Club on Friday morning was not complex. No, it was cut it, and dried. It presented it as a cut and dried case. Now, this is... Uh, this is, I suspect, going to get more nuanced. I, I've, I've had a, a chat with a couple of people in Hong Kong, and the, I think there are, there are two elements of the appeal that, obviously, that, um, Harry Stuart Moore 
Sylvester to Caesar's solicitor said, I can confirm there will be appeal, but we won't go into details, quite rightly. But I, I think that um, one will be the severity of the ban in, in terms of uh, Wagner Borges has, has been done for 12 months for placing a bet, and this so-called facilitation has resulted in a, a 10-month ban. Um, I think that... Well, we don't know what the facilitation well, is. Is it simply a question of being present when Wagner Borges has sought to place the bet? Is it a question of being in the same room, of having knowledge of it? Uh, my, my information is that um, it is a, a failure to report knowledge of another jockey having a bet. So it wasn't as if he said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll, I can help you out with that, but merely the, the allegation was that he was aware of it and admitted to being aware of it but not reporting it. Mm. So that, as I say, it was, it was presented in very much black and white terms on Friday, but th from, from what I hear, it's a lot more nuanced than that. Here's an interesting one, though, for the BHA, James. If, if there's a petition for the BHA not to reciprocate... That's that's going to put them in a. I, I don't think it's a question. I think they, racing all has to keep together. I, unfortunately for Sylvester, I think he's an absolutely superb human being and a fantastic jockey. I think there would be too much backlash if they didn't. I think they'd have to reciprocate the ban. And particularly at the moment, given given Hong Kong's extremely powerful position in, in global racing. You could be talking about a significant diplomatic incident if it was Absolutely a right. that was not you reciprocated. Know, we, we've, we've hitched our wagon to the star of world pool betting and, and there is a clearly a, an, a, an unmistakable financial opportunity. Well, the 130 Derby will tell you that. In that, yeah. And I, I, I can't see any way in which the, it'd be the... For a, an organisation that is not known for making... Bold calls. I think that's fair to say. I think that this would be a, um, an incredibly uh, bold one to make. Just one final point with this, mm. and that is that we often sort of observe and, and lament in Britain that the, the wheels of justice in British racing um, grind with glacial speed. This race was on the 26th of April. What are we on now? The 14th, 15th, 15th of May, isn't yep. it today? So that's you might think. They well, have they out. not? Have they not gone about that with, with, uh, improper haste? I don't know. It certainly doesn't seem a, a great length of well, time. You can't have it? it both ways. No, you well, I'm, I'm just. To I'm not trying to have it both ways. Yeah. I'm just. I'm just making the point that, you know, it's it's what is that? A um, couple of weeks, yeah. Nineteen days. Yeah. Well, yeah, seventeen days yeah. until Friday. Point taken. Princess Zoe is a mare that went from rags to riches and proved herself one of the most popular horses in training. She was trained by a Tony Mullins for owner Frank Keogh, and they enjoyed wonderful success with her, including against all the odds at grade one level, a uh, group one level, I should say, on the flat. She ran quite well over hurdles at Cheltenham, but not to the owner's satisfaction since when there's been great rancor between owner and trainer. And this week, uh, this story reached its fruition with the owner declaring his intention to remove her from Tony Mullins' yard. Indeed, he did remove it from Tony Mullins' yard. Mullins was emotional uh, and said he'd never felt even about Dawn Run as strongly as he feels about this mare. And uh, it, it got an extraordinary response. Safi, we, we hear about horses being removed from trainers all the time, but this one seems to have really um, stirred the emotions of many in the sport. What's yeah, your perspective I think, on as it? you said, such a bags to riches story and um, there's so many people following her. And I think her whole journey has been very public um, via, via Twitter or social media and yeah, I think I think it's hard for trainers and stable staff and everyone like that who have a, feel like they have a connection with a certain horse, especially a a really good horse like that. And I think uh, it's obviously in, within his legal right to move a horse, but uh, God, it's at such a latter stage of her career, it's um, it seems pretty harsh. You just sort of wonder: is it really worth it? Is what is the possibility of her? of her going forward from this and doing anything more than she's already done. The owner has gone on record as saying, James, that he was concerned for the for the mayor's health. I think that's a very vague statement to put. You know, I, I, Tony Mullen, he's obviously got an amazing um, reputation. I, you know, the horse is obviously being cared for greatly. Um, Unfortunately, um, as Safi said, you know, however close the staff and the trainer are to the horses, unfortunately we do not own them and 
he has the right to do with it what he wants. Which um, is tough, but you know, as trainers, we do lose horses, and we're sad to see them go, especially especially ones such as this. And um, you know, but um, he's entitled to do it. Any comment, Dave? Not really. I think it's a um, a difficult one from a, a non-horsey perspective, mm -hmm. in that you see a legal perspective, which is it's it's very sad, but. Legally, obviously, the owner can do what he likes, uh, but there is obviously much more of a sort of um, razor wire levels of of emotional investment that that the stable and and those around horses put into them, and so it, it can't just be <coughs> boiled down to the bones of a of a legal arrangement. Uh, the field for the pre de train off the maximum field size has been increased by four from twenty to twenty four. You remember last year when Very Elegant didn't make it into the race because she was a handicap by the French handicappers too low to make the cut. And there was significant um, disquiet after that from her trainer, uh, Francis Graffard. And France Gallo has, has responded and said, right, let's make the field bigger. It's quite a, an un-2023 move, this, isn't it, James? Because mm. normally we're talking about field sizes coming down, the derbies come down over the years. But Olivier Delois, the chief secretary of France Gallo, said there's, there's plenty of room at Longchamp. It's perfectly safe to have 24 runners. Well, I, I can understand potentially why they've done it, you know, m more entry fees, etc. But... Um, you know, and if you've got a horse good enough to, to run in the arc, you probably wouldn't want to be, like Francis Graffard was, you wouldn't want to be hand, um, told you couldn't run. But I, I don't really have a strong view on it either way, but um, I can understand why they've done it. It's quite responsive, quite quick. Um, do you fancy riding in a 24-runner arc? Yeah, to be fair, though, I... I you ride in a 50-runner arc. I wouldn't you? care, yeah. Um, but... <laughs> I, I, I don't, there hasn't been that many arcs where it's been a full field size anyway, has no. there? So um, I think it's just, as for the likes of Very Elegant, who made a massive journey up there with a specific race in mind, I think it just covers all bases and um, allows that to be the case so no one's feeling left out. Of course, the big question, Dave, is will they ever let Geldings run in the arc? That would, yes. be, a more, that would be a more contentious change. Yeah, uh, uh, as Safi said, it's not, it's not something that, comes up very often. This uh, Urban Sea beat 22 rivals in 93. Um, 2014 had been the previous time there was a full field price last year. But it, of course, Very Elegant was a, a, a big part of the art build-up last mm. year, wasn't she? Mm. You know, we, we were writing about her an awful lot. It was a very, it was an interesting story. And the fact that she couldn't get in, it, it detracted from the race, despite the fact that she hadn't lived up in Europe to what she'd done in Australia. Charles Burns has found himself in the regulatory wires again, this time uh, under the uh, non-triers rule in Ireland. Let's just have a look at the video footage here. Uh, Dave, just talk me through the rudiments of this. What's he been done and for how long? Right, well, El Art is the horse in question. Uh, Charles Burns got a €6,000 fine. Uh, jockey Garode Bruder was banned for 21 days and the horse was banned from running for 90. Yeah, they, it's just in the shadow uh, of a couple of runners here, but you can see the you see why the stewards came to the conclusion that um, neither jockey nor trainer had uh, well that they they'd both been either deliberate or reckless uh, in causing or permitting a horse uh, to run other than on its merits. There there, there is a yeah I mean obviously that as as punters. You rely on horses running on their merits, and it, evidently that's not what happened here. We'll look at it again. There, there's a, a slightly um, more serious aspect to this, though. Uh, the, the fact that the, the, the jockey reported the horse had made a noise. Uh, the steward said, "Why?" Mm. At, um, at Goran said, "Why didn't you pull him up?" Um, the uh, they, they asked Charles Burns, he said he wasn't satisfied with the ride, but he was satisfied with the decision not to pull the horse up, um, and said that he was only a lowly rated animal, yeah. which is like, well, well, we might as well have just pushed him to the line, and not that that's really what uh, Garo Bruder did there, but um, the, the implication being that this is a horse with a, a lower rating, and so therefore deserves uh, lower standards of care. Of care than a, a horse rated you know we, we, we've uh, been through it? we've been through weeks of this from april the 15th with animal rising we're constantly bombarded with accusations that we use horses as as commodities and 
in addition to the charge of, of running on merits, the idea that, well, he's only a lowly rated horse. So it, it, the horse has made a, a noise that when he ran the time before as well, I believe. So, Isn't there an, another important he- point here, Safi, which is that there seems to have been this understanding down the years in Britain and Ireland and possibly elsewhere, I don't know, but certainly in these two countries, that if, um, if trainer and jockey get called in for a running and riding inquiry, it's kind of, there's carte blanche for the trainer to throw the jockey under the bus and say, I wasn't happy with the ride. The jockey takes his medicine. Their relationship continues harmoniously. And this is what's happened here, but the stewards have actually rejected Charles Burns's attempt to, to just let Garo Bruder hang for the, for the ride. I mean, from a jockey's point of view, you know, they, they can't, especially younger jockeys, they can't be taking the, the full responsibility and the hit for this all the time, can they? The trainer's got to share some responsibility. Yeah, no, I think I think they've made the right decision. Um, I'm very lucky. I've never ever, and I hope they will never ever will will never be in that situation. And um, yeah, I, it's slightly cliche, isn't it? Just chuck them under the bus, and it's it was it did sort of make me giggle when you saw the Racing Post report with the brackets underneath for the stewards' inquiry, and it seemed to go on for about two pages, but. Um, it's actually rather more straightforward than the two pages. Yeah. 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 And that is why the system is in place to deal with situations that, like that's that. That's something that I think a bit of progress has been made over the centuries, isn't it? Is that, that, that it was very much the case when I came into racing yeah. professionally in the early 90s, you know, that they put a white fiver in the, in the jockey's pocket and said, you're going to have to take the rap for this. And, and now at least we're a bit more realistic and a bit more adult and a... Um, a bit fairer in the way that we look at these things. Absolutely, and I think you know the the jockeys have got to be somewhat somewhat protected in in that regard as as well. Let's talk about Chester. Um, this week, their chief executive Louise Stewart, both in print and then on television on ITV, um, fired a few warning shots across the bows of the industry which seeks to restructure racing, particularly on Saturdays to declutter weekends. Chester would be. You could argue a sufferer under the current plans because they don't have the premier fixture on a Saturday normally and they'd be asked to start later, start earlier, move fixtures or whatever just for the greater good. But clearly a big part of their footfall business model is on getting people to the course on a Saturday. James, you'd be quite well across this premierisation drive. Should the courses take a bit of pain for each other or not? Absolutely. I don't think racing is going to survive unless the race courses pull together and work together. Um, you know the experts and the powers that be have decided that this is the right way to go forward and um, you can't make an omelette without breaking some eggs and whatever decision is going to be made is not going to be not, not you can't make everyone happy but um, you know it's coming to a time where race courses do have to pull together and, and work and make racing better and of course if your whole plan is based on Saturdays and lots of people going and you want them to go in the afternoon it's going to be tough for a race course like that isn't it yeah, and do you know what? every Saturday race meeting you go, there's always a crowd, and especially at Chester, it's always absolutely rammed. Um, and that has to be obviously a part of their model of getting people through the gates. And um, I think as jockeys and as trainers, I think I think we accept that that weekends are always going to be busy because it's race courses want to entertain people and get people through the gates, and that's obviously their their weekend. Having said that, Dave. If racecourses are determined to get the limelight on a Saturday, both from a television point of view and a timings point of view, they have got the power to do that by putting on really good and valuable races. Absolutely. After the OFT ruling of 2003-04, the BHA doesn't have complete control of the fixture list. Um, yeah, it was interesting that Louise Stewart in- mentioned that uh, she invoked um, <coughs> horse welfare among the potential ramifications of lost revenue, that, that um, the, the guest experience, the facilities and equine welfare could suffer. I think at the moment, what race courses what are doing... What does she mean by equine welfare could suffer? I don't get that. That if the, inco- if the course's income is hit by fewer people coming through the gates yeah. um, as a result of having to move the fixture, then that is one of the things that would suffer. It, uh, what, how? Well, the, the money that they can... The, the money that the track would spend on that, presumably. Okay. But um, all tracks at the moment, aren't they, are saying 
you know, and what the underlining point with Louis Stewart said, we need to understand the market a little better than we do at the moment, and we need more robust consumer data. Two minutes is not enough, I'm afraid, to cat uh, catalogue the, the woes of American racing at the moment. But I was there last week, and I go back for the Preakness next week, which will be without um, Forte, because he's still on the Vets list, having been withdrawn from the Kentucky Derby by the Vets on the morning of the race. There's a horse trained by Todd Pletcher, champion juvenile, won the Breeders' Cup juvenile. It emerged in an article in the New York Times this week. Uh, Joe Drape wrote that article, and he was uh, passed information by an insider at, uh, in New York that Forte... Uh, had failed uh, a test, failed a, a test or tested positive uh, for a substance in New York after he won the hopeful stakes uh, last year. This information didn't emerge until this week, and that race was run in September. He's trained by Todd Pletcher, owned by Mike Rapoli, um, both of whom have been quite vocal this week in a war of words with the authorities um, as regards who it was that <coughs> delayed this information coming into the public domain. It's a complex case. It's a small amount of a, an unlicensed medication for, for horses that has been found, suggested at the time it could be environmental contamination. But I'll put it to you guys, James, first of all, that outside the United States, if you're not baked into the sport, if you're not absolutely invested into the sport, it, you're not inclined to distinguish between people who are charged with... Um, rank offences of, uh, of cheating and doping and instances of complex medication overages. Outside the sport, you just see this headline in the New York Times and you think, well, racing's gone to the dogs. Yes, and I think that that's where, you know, the system here is, is can be seen as much better and it'd be wonderful if the history on they're trying to get everything under one banner. Mm. And I think that... It's the Horse Racing Integrity yeah, and Safety Act, which exactly. at the time of this was not... Um, where, where it, is. It, it, it was not um, it, yet equipped to be dealing with unification of medication policy, though will be very shortly. Mm. Well, I just think everything needs to be unified. and see Everyone needs to sing off the same hymn sheet, to be honest. We don't have these cases come up in our country very often, and you know, I, I think there's good reason for that. Um, but, Dave, this is the interesting point here. You know, we do have, quite regularly, instances of you know, medication overages, people mis mistaking withdrawal times, environmental contamination, and um, they get dealt with by the BHA. Sometimes people's satisfaction, sometimes not. But when this happens now in the United States, against the backdrop of service and Navarro and everything that they've had to deal with, the Kentucky Derby disqualification of Medina Spirit, it all just gets lumped into the same pot, and everybody says, well, the whole game stinks. It does, and it, it, you, you use the word, the expression baked in uh, with regard to how the public perceive those trans transgressions. But also, anyone who isn't baked into American racing... This is it. This is the only race that they watch, isn't it? Exactly. It's, it's the, t the great... Is it the greatest two minutes of, in sport? Of, yeah. In sport, you know, so... And, and, and also, uh, I was going to say tabloids. I work for a tabloid. The, but the, the press in general uh, will use a phrase, you know, it, they will not seek the, the, the nuance in a transgression because a headline, if it says, drugs cheat wins race X, well, that sells more papers or gets more hits or whatever it might be than, than if you do look into the nuance and say, well, it's, this isn't quite as it seems, you know. And that becomes um, pretty problematic. Uh, more of that, no doubt, next week and beyond. But those, for the moment, were this week's talking points. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.